Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with David Mancic. It's a pleasure to chat with you. I'm so excited to talk about this topic. You have extensive research and you've done a lot of work in this topic, um, specifically JFK. If you'd like to introduce yourself to uh, the audience out there listening and we can get right to it. Yes, I'm David Mantic. Would you like to explain a little bit more about yourself? Well, most people know who I am. All right. Um, when it comes to JFK, where do you typically fall like with JFK? I know you you work extensively a lot in it or you research a lot on it when it comes to the magic bullet, comes as a Pruder film. Where would you like to start? Medical evidence. Medical that's evidence. Always, that's always first. Okay. So what exactly when we talk about medical evidence? Well, we can start with the autopsy. Okay. All right. With the autopsy, what exactly did you want to point out some key features for people to keep in mind when they examine the autopsy or look at the issues with the autopsy. James Humes was the chief pathologist and he provided some misleading reports in his autopsy, specifically with respect to the x-rays. Okay. When it comes to the x-rays, what exactly did you notice that were specific things that were off? Well, the x-rays that we have in evidence that are available to the public show a bullet fragment trail going across the top of the skull. But in his autopsy report, Humes described this as entering low on the back of the head. This is a discrepancy of four inches. That's about 10 centimeters. That's just an unbelievable error by a professional pathologist. Yeah, that's, an, that's a big error. That's something that somebody should have picked up, right? Like That's stupefying. That... That's totally stupefying. How does that get through? It's not only Humes. He had two assistants who signed on to this. So we have three professional pathologists, one from the Army and two from the Navy, all of them making a four inch mistake. Is that believable? It seems I mean, I'm, I'm with you that there's definitely some foul play there, but it just seems like somebody else would have picked up on that or at least spoke up at some point. But they allowed all this to get through, which leads to this kind of giant situation that we're in where we're looking back on a topic where it should have been handled and addressed there, but it wasn't. Correct. It wasn't a blunder. It was obviously a situation they were forced into. Hims was told that there were three shots fired and he was they're quite specifically told that they were all from behind. So he could not accept any shots from the front and all the shots had to be attributed to one gunman. So he was totally boxed into a corner. So he found a bullet entrance low on the back of the head, but at the same time, he sees on the X-ray that that's totally inconsistent because the bullet trail is across the top of the head, four inches higher. So in his report, he had no choice because he's under huge political pressure to mislocate on purpose the bullet trail across the top of the skull x-rays. He described them instead as starting low on the back of the head. So he could draw a conclusion that there was only one shot that successfully hit the head, low on the back of the head, and he'd ignore the x-ray evidence. And that was pointed out in uh, JFK Revisited, Oliver Stone's film, where they talked about moving the bullet hole um, down. And then they actually saw pictures. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a bullet hole that was clear that it did not match the one that was uh, put into the autopsy report. We don't have any good photographs of the bullet entry hole in the official ensemble at the National Archives. They probably existed at one point, but they had to get rid of them would have been too too embarrassing so i mean where where do you want to start when it comes to the flaws that were going on because i mean you we can sit there and say a higher or a deeper darker force is at play in a lot of those situations when it comes to wrapping this case up with a you know a fancy bow on it you know they were trying to cover up they wanted to get an answer as soon as possible but a lot of people don't believe that 
a lot of people don't want to think that there's that type of darkness that goes with it. But I mean, if you watch or you just examine a lot of the evidence that's laid out there, there's a lot of stuff where it's like a situation like this situation that should have been handled and should have been carefully, thoroughly looked through. And there's a lot of like, hurry up and close this, hurry up and close that. We have three shots fired, one shooter. It, there's a lot of stuff that leaves the question. Well, people's lives were at stake. If not their lives, at least their careers, their futures, their pensions, everything about their whole past history was at stake in this event. The CIA was directly involved. The FBI participated in the cover-up. You know, the strongest possible political and intelligence forces uh, were at serious risk here. So they, they couldn't allow this to get out of hand. And they could not allow the, the box to be open to consider conspiracy. That was just out of the question from the very first day. So they made up a bullet that could magically go through one person and do all these weird kind of trajectories and defy gravity. Whatever, whatever it took, they made it up. I just, I, it's, I don't, I, I, why do you think the public went with it? Was there a lot of question, like people raising questions? Well, the, the public wasn't so sure about this, even in the polls taken right after uh, Ruby shot Oswald, there was a lot of skepticism in the public mind and there still is. So we can't say that the public went along with it. Uh, even today, as I travel around the country, seeing mostly older patients with cancer, I, I cannot find anyone who really accepts the official line in, in my generation, they don't. The younger generation is more close-minded. They've been brainwashed by the media. But in my generation, no, hardly anyone believes the official story. And with the x-ray, was it just that the bullet was off four inches that you found issues with, or were there other errors? Well, the other big issue, of course, is the so-called cross-section of a bullet, which we see on the frontal x-ray. It's located inside JFK's right orbit. So this x-ray was supposedly taken at the autopsy. The whole purpose of taking x-rays at the autopsy was to identify forensic bullets or bullet fragments so they could be used in solving this case. And none of the three pathologists described any such bullet. The x-rays were placed on a public viewing box there at the morgue so that most likely several dozen people saw these x-rays and they understood what was being looked for and yet no one reported anything like this. There's no discussion of this 6.5 millimeter, nearly round bullet-like object in JFK's right orbit. How, how did everybody miss it? Well, they didn't, they didn't miss it. During the ARRB, uh, Douglas Horn and Jeremy Gunn pointedly asked each of the three pathologists independently whether they had seen this during the autopsy. And all three of them under oath clearly said, no, it wasn't there. But it's on the x-rays in the archives today. That's uh, it's, it's even weirder when you start realizing that when they were doing the autopsy, that the autopsy was moved as well, too. There was a initial one that was going to happen, but they had to bring, if I'm not mistaken, the body to Washington. Um and then when they were examining, they were looking for a tracheotomy or trying to do something like that. And they examined that there was a bullet hole in his head. Yes. And they're like, he's, he's pronounced dead. Why are you doing a tracheotomy on someone who's dead? Like, there's just a lot of stuff where it's like, did these people have any expertise in checking a, a dead body at all? Like noticing if there was any of these markings, how do you miss a bullet to the head? Well, they didn't miss it. They just ignored it. That's a, that's a big thing to ignore. That's much, that's much easier. You just ignore it. Oh, man. That's a big thing to ignore, though, especially if you're talking. Well, they about had to. Process. If they would have accepted a bullet entry near the site you were just pointing to, that would have meant a frontal bullet and therefore conspiracy. They couldn't go there. That was impossible politically. Well, when you were looking into this is this just from your work at the archives that you've just been digging through all this information like how much of the information that's in the archives is actually information that's not like i mean is most of it just stuff that has issues with it or is there a lot of like clear evidence or clear pointing to like the real truth behind what happened with jfk 
Well, the x-rays have uh, three really clear signs of alteration. That's how the 6.5 millimeter uh, round object in JFK's right orbit caught into the record. It was added later, probably within the first week or so after the assassination. And it was probably added by John Ebersole, the radiologist in the dark room. So were all these people connected and knowing what's going on? Like, were there any of these people, like even with the Warren Commission, you can see that there's a lot of people that were not either answering questions or said that they couldn't answer questions when interviewers would ask them. But also there's a lot of people that were stepping down from their positions because they didn't want to be involved in the in the commission anymore, which makes you question. There are probably things that they've seen or things that they were told to do that they felt like they couldn't do anymore. And it makes you wonder who's the group of people that were involved in covering up this thing? Well, the Secret Service was in control of the autopsy photographs and the autopsy x-rays. So James Rowley was the chief, so he has to be implicated fairly directly. And what exactly, like, because there's, I mean, reports about people, uh, especially at the plaza, for instance, there's um, interviewers or people that should have been probably interviewed and talked to about this, but their testimonies, either the ones that they got and the ones that they didn't get, there was some issues going on with those as well, too. Yes, you want to name some names or do you want me to? Um, if you want to name some names, sure. I can't think of, I'm trying to think of the lady's name off the top of my head. There was two people going down a flight of stairs where they said they encountered Lee Harvey Oswald, but right, um, they only right. talked to one and not the other one, which I thought was like, that's a big thing right there. You should sure. want to talk to both people. Yeah. The witness testimony in this case is really bizarre. So many witness statements were changed. And, and we know that from speaking to the very same witnesses after the fact, after they saw their testimony and they observed how it had been changed. Uh, but of course, if you were trying to cover something up, you had to do that. You couldn't let anything leak out that might suggest conspiracy. So the witnesses were, were very, very strongly indicating conspiracy shots from the front and their comments about where Oswald was and what he was doing. These all contradicted the official story. So these statements had to be changed and they were. Well, I mean, even with witness testimonies or statements being changed, does that not impact their lives as well, too? I mean, imagine if you're trying to let people know the truth and you're being told you're a conspiracy person because that's not what the official record states. Well, it's like, well, did anybody question the official record? Well, the witnesses learned their lessons very quickly. Many of them simply shut up because they knew that they were under serious threat. And there's reason to believe that some, some witnesses actually lost their lives because of what they said. But in any case, they, they got the message and many of the witnesses just shut up and refused to talk about this anymore. And of course, the, the best examples are the doctors at Parkland Hospital who were very specifically advised not to talk about this. And same goes for the autopsy paraprofessional personnel at the autopsy. They were delivered a clear-cut military command, shut up about this or you'll be in major trouble. And they heard this loud and clear, and so they shut up. Well, they couldn't even reach out to get a pathologist. They were threatened by Secret Service members to not even um, to do it right there with the tools that they had when they wanted to get a professional in there who had expertise in being able to examine and do a proper autopsy. No, it was under military control. Well, yeah, but that... That's such a secret, though. I'm just wondering why it's been covered up for so long. I mean, I get there's a lot of people that know about it and know the truth behind it as well, too. But I mean, for the general public, is it is that the records that they're still keeping that we don't have information on yet? Well, I think we we know pretty well what happened with the medical records and the autopsy. That's well described in great detail in all of my work. What what's still being covered up, of course, are the intelligence connections that lie behind this. I don't think we'll ever see any. Uh, very serious, incriminating evidence that's probably all been destroyed already. Well, this is a lot with like people that um, who are involved in these situations on their deathbed, usually that usually want to confess to a lot of these issues as well, too. It's where we get a lot of information. Like um, I know Tom O'Neill has a book about uh, Charles Manson and the Manson murders and the CIA and all that. And he's going out like driving around in his book. He was talking about going and interviewing some of these people and talking about these people that are on like their deathbed that want to come clean with all the information. I mean, there's a lot of information that we have and we can show and there's proof of that there's 
really core issues wrong with this case. One in specific that I don't know if you know too much about, but the brain, for instance, did they get that from the Bethesda Medical Center or wherever they were doing, like they actually did cadaver bodies? Like, cause this brain did not match one that would be shot with a bullet. No, there, there are at least two brains involved in this whole case. One is a fake and one is authentic. So the x-rays show the authentic brain. And so I've done uh, many, many uh, measurements on the actual skull x-rays to ascertain how much brain was left inside the skull as they were doing the autopsy. And it turns out to be about two thirds of the brain was still left in the skull as, as the measurements on the x-rays show. Only about two thirds was left. But if you look at the photograph of the brain, as we see it today in the National Archives, it's virtually all intact. It's not 100%, but it's surely much, much more than two thirds. So we have immediately a gross discrepancy between the brain as seen in the skull x-rays and the brain as photographed. One of these is wrong. They cannot both be correct. So somebody either faked the x-rays and changing the size of the brain, or they faked the photographs. Well, the obvious easy answer is that this is just a fake brain in the photographs. And um, especially with the people that talked about taking photographs of the brain that couldn't remember taking that or never took. Yeah, the official photos. photographer denied taking the brain photographs. And that's, that's in the official record under oath. He said, no, the, these are not the photographs of the brain I took. And the reason I know this is because the film type is wrong. And because I took photographs of a sliced brain and this brain is not sliced. And that's because to track the bullish trajectory, you yes. slice the brain. Like you, you, the you do it slice by slice so you can see exactly where the trajectory is. That's what so he, he officially denied it. That's what made me question this whole thing, which was if, the way now I understand we can get into the Zapruder film and everything about that, too. But when I was trying to understand, like, because I saw the film and that was the first thing that sparked. Up. I remember seeing that, like, when I was like 16 and then I was like, well, if he got shot from the side and you see the back of the car is just filled with blood, then its brain's not going to be intact like that photo is. So I'm like, did they stitch the brain together? And they're like, no, you didn't think about them using a different brain. James Hume's was the chief pathologist at the autopsy, was in charge of the weekly brain cutting sessions at Bethesda. That is, they had a weekly meeting where brains were actually sliced, analyzed, and diagnosed. He was in charge of that. So he knew exactly how to interpret brain injuries. He was not very experienced with gunshot wounds to the brain, but that's, that's a separate issue. Uh, even, even somebody with common sense medical knowledge like me, who supposedly had no pathologic experience, could see a brain, could identify a trajectory through the brain. And Humes could certainly have done that. So to say that he was inexperienced with brain injury is, is simply unfair. That's really unjustified. When it comes to when the x-rays were taken chronologically to all the events that took place after Kennedy was shot, is that displaced way before the autopsies and everything, or is that during the autopsies? Uh, try that try that again. The x-ray. When did the x-ray take place in like the events that all of the x-rays were taken for the most part before the, the pathologist got involved in examining the body? So the x-ray accounts for a bullet that's in his head? Well, on the on the original x-ray, there is no large bullet fragment to specifically identify with a bullet. There are tiny metallic fragments which you cannot specifically connect to a bullet. Seven by two millimeters was the largest met metal fragment on the X-ray that was possibly forensically useful, but that's far too small to uh, uh, connect to a bullet of any kind. And especially not the bullet that they show in that no. this is the bullet that killed JFK. And I mean, it, no it, way. it doesn't make sense. It's like perfectly intact and it only has a small little dent on the top of it. And it's like, even if they're saying it, this is the bullet that went through all these people, it wouldn't be perfectly displaced like that either, which means that that just knocks out the shooter yeah. and the magic bullet theory. The other irony about the x-rays, <clears throat> I'm talking about the so-called bullet fragment inside JFK's right orbit as viewed on the frontal x-ray. Its dimension is 6.5 millimeters, which is exactly the same number 
that identifies the Manley Carcano bullet that Oswald supposedly shot. What are the odds that those measurements of 6.5 millimeters would be exactly the same? So what was the point of blaming Oswald for it? Like, Well, he was behind Kennedy. So if all the shots came from behind, then you could uh, avoid the possibility of conspiracy. Until that guy in that interview that talked about he was shot in the head and pointed oh, to... Oh, that's him. conspiracy, yeah, right away. How was that a conspiracy? That. Well... <clears throat> Oswald goes behind, so that's part of the official story that he fired from behind. So if you have somebody else firing from in front, you have at least two shooters, and more than one shooter means conspiracy automatically by definition. Does that not seem like they're doing a lot of work, more work than they would if they just came clean and just admitted to what they did or admitted to just that, that we don't know? There seems like there was more than one shooter. Like, it seems like you could pin the blame on more than just one person. It would be easier for you than doing all this, you know, looped around to hide evidence and, you know, mess with things to be able to show this narrative that they want to spin. Well, um, Mr. Wade, famous for Wade versus Roe, the same way. On the evening of November 22nd, uh, we have, he said something like this, we have evidence that there were more than, uh, that there was more than one shooter. He said that publicly. So a lot of people knew and understood that there was conspiracy from the beginning, but of course they later were forced to change their opinion. It seems like with a lot of interviews, you hear a lot of people slowly leaking out information like they, it's so hard to keep a lie going for so long, like to keep make sure that you're covering every, you know, it's hard to give the same response and make the story line up every single time, especially when it is a story. You know, Lying is very difficult, it's very yeah. difficult to achieve consistently. And of course, they didn't. Is there anything that really stumped you about the JFK case? Well, I had to think a lot about how they forged the x-rays at first. I did not realize exactly how that would have been feasible in 1963. Um, but I had to go back to some old textbooks that were published in 1961 to learn how x-ray uh, forgery could take place. And the recipes are spelled out very clearly in this wonderful textbook from 1961, which was actually reviewed in 1963 quite favorably. So I've explained in my work exactly how it was done. The forgery occurred in the dark room, a little bit like Xerox copying, but it's done through a second exposure. And I think it may be a little too complex to explain this uh, in a, a verbal interview like this, but you can find my detailed vi visual explanations online in my lectures. Would that lead to someone having a connection with someone in the x-ray room or uh, just that type of equipment to be able to forge those types of things? Like that's not something where you can just walk in and be like, I need to do this type of x-ray. You need to have like a whole place kind of, at least, in, especially in a case like this, kind of shut away from it, at least the general public. Yeah, you'd have the specialist do it. And, and the specialist on the job was John Ebersole. In fact, I, I've had uh, two interviews with John Ebersole one of them was recorded and is now at the National Archives. And so we'd been chatting for 10 to 15 minutes. And I finally came to the point and I asked him about this 6.5 millimeter object. I was curious how he was going to explain this, especially since nobody had seen it at the autopsy. So I was wondering how in the world did it get on the X-ray images during the intervening several years between the autopsy and its public disclosure years later by the Clark panel. So I asked him, um, uh, Dr. Ebersole, do you remember seeing that 6.5 millimeter object uh, inside JFK's right orbit on the x-rays? And at that instant, he said not a single additional word about the JFK autopsy to anyone. That was the end of anyone's talking to John Ebersole. With all the, see, this is what's strange to me is that how are all the, these, are, do you think it's a money thing? Like they're being quiet because they're getting money somehow? Do you think? No, it's just political power. Yeah, but I mean, unless it's threatening your life. I mean, oh, yes. Many people felt that their lives were threatened, if not their lives and their careers. That's what I could see with them. They were, there was a lot of fright. And there are some people today, today, more than 55 years later, who still won't talk. They are that afraid. Do you think, like, I mean, 
a big push falls on people like yourself and other people that are researching this case and trying to get the information out there and make sure that the general public is aware and especially get more clarity on this event. I mean, they weren't expecting people to research this much into it. They kind of probably thought it was going to be like most of the general public, at least in a sense with a lot of stuff that happens now where they kind of accept it, nod their head and go on. But there's a, a big group of people and even older generations, like you were mentioning earlier, that believe that there was definitely a conspiracy behind it, but it's just kind of faded away in some aspects of things. Um, I'm pretty sure people still would like to know the answer, but it's kind of like how 9-11 is. Like people, there's definitely a little bit of stuff that's a little bit mixed up, but people move on, they go on to the next day. And I, I think it's important that we get clarity on the issues that are still like, even if it's in the past, I mean, you need events like this to be 100% honest and out there, not just something where it's like, oh, yeah, he was assassinated and then move on. It's like, well, that's not that simple. There's a lot of issues that we need to start pointing at. And we need to get clarity on these issues. Well, if you believe the CIA was involved, as most researchers do, is that still a, a live issue? Do we still have a CIA today? What are they doing today? Yeah, so for most people, History is pretty irrelevant and nothing like this matters. And of course, we have to admit that the plotters did succeed. They covered this up. So we're still talking about the issue because a few of us, a very few of us, really do care about the truth and want to know what happened. Uh, and I think it's a very live issue today. Well, I mean, if they were successful at it, you don't just stop doing something when you're successful at it. Like that doesn't... Sure. That's, that's not how it works. And I think even it just talking about this type of stuff, it gets into this area where people go, oh, that's conspiracy. No, it's not a conspiracy. They, there's a plot to kill JFK. They they did. They tried it multiple times before. Oh, yes, they tried several times before. That's not my area of expertise, but there were plots uh, in Chicago and in Florida as well. And um, when it comes to the x-rays that are actually in the archives, I mean, if it's for the general public to be able to look at, what's the first thing that they can tell? Like, is it, is it something even worth credible of pointing people towards, like just to show them that this is proof? I mean, is it something that if it's that different from the original ones, the actual ones that were taken rather than the ones that they faked? I mean, you have something like that that's a crucial piece of a piece of history in a sense, even if it's faked. But it's for a lot of people that can look at it. And it, that skews a lot of people's information processes, much like me in the Zapruder film. Well, I would start with that 6.5 millimeter nearly round object in JFK's right orbit. That was not reported by anybody at the autopsy, but yet there it is. How do you explain that? Nobody has explained that except uh, the possibility that I suggested that it was just a simple second exposure in a dark room. That's a complete, exp complete explanation in my book. The measurements I've taken at the archives and the measurements I've taken on a real cross-section of a bullet uh, put that whole argument to rest. Has this caused you to look at things differently? Like, are you still researching more into the topic and trying to get clarity on it as well too? I mean, with your work, for instance, like, are you more focused into this? Like, do you spend a lot more of your time in this or do you work on other objects and other things as well too, besides you, your patients? Well, I have a career as a, medic, as a radiation oncologist, which I practice regularly to this very day. I'm off this week, but I'm working next week in uh, Redlands, where I often work. So my JFK work is just done in a few quiet hours that I have. Man, I, this this type of thing is once I start learning about it, I was like, this would just consume me. This is just something that's like, because it's scary. It's not like, this isn't fantasy. Like people want to believe it's not a movie. This is real. This is something that's going on that a lot of people need to be aware of. And it's, you have people that just go, uh, it's too much. And they just walk away from it. Or you have people that are really wanting to get the information out there, but it's not an easy topic. It's not good to know that this could happen, especially to someone like the president and it's your own government's doing, you know, there's a lot of people that were a hundred percent in probably on wanting Oswald to suffer or even something like that. But I know there's a book about a friend of Oswald's where he wrote talking about like this wasn't him or something like You're that. You're talking about Ernest Tidovitz? Yeah. MD, PhD, his yeah. best friend and only really good English speaker while he was living in Minsk. Well, yeah, I mean, every, everyone should read that book and see if that comports with the 
media image of Oslo. It, it totally doesn't. Do you think it uh, with um, Oswald's death, for instance, do you think that just gave, I guess, kind of put the whole investigation into Oswald? Like when you even see the report or you see the videotape of Oswald saying, I didn't shoot the president, I didn't do this. He's just, he, it, it, it's not like he's lying. And a lot of people probably were 100% okay with him lying, but they smeared him. They smeared him. They said that he was handing out pamphlets saying that he was a communist or he was a, a Russian sympathizer, Cuban, whatever. And it's just like it didn't make sense where you start trying to find the paper trail and finding the money trail. And you have a lot of people in positions of power that were more than willing to cover that up. Well, for my part, I can tell you that if Oswald truly was the lone gunman, no one would be happier than me because it would absolve the government of an incredible number of really illicit steps. Why would they do all those illegal things if Oswald had done it himself? It's, the whole thing is paradoxical. But anyway, I would be happier if it really were true that Oswald had done it. So unfortunately, that's not the case. And when it comes to the documents that they haven't released, I know we I keep going back to that because it's just it's this weird thing that they keep delaying and delaying and delaying. Is that just names of people like is, is there people alive still today that could be involved or might have information on this or is everyone basically kind of moved on? Well, most witnesses, uh, most contemporaneous witnesses are dead, of course, but uh, there are a few who are still living. But I don't think you're, you're going to see any smoking guns ever coming out. The, the power elite will make sure that that, that never happens. And when it comes to your interviews that you've done, like people that you've talked to, I know you mentioned the one a minute ago, 15 minutes. Um, which which one to you where you felt like you had, you should have asked maybe a different question or maybe you should have asked something that probably would have been, because I, I always examine like just from doing a podcast perspective, I see the interviews like in JFK revisited, a lot of interviewers asking people in the Warren Commission that they're like, they can't, they can't answer those questions. I'm like, you would think you would press a little bit more like you're inviting people onto a, a public platform, a news platform that are involved in the research or, or the investigation into something like this. They know they're going to be answering tough questions. They can't just leave you with a no or this type of thing. You feel like you would hit them with something harder or pressure onto them a little bit more. Well, the ARRB did a wonderful job on follow up questions. I've alluded to them already. They had the chance to ask very pointed questions of each of the three pathologists, specifically about the 6.5 millimeter fragment. That was a big deal. Nobody remembered that, nobody saw it, nobody reported on it. That would have been, should have been the most important thing in the autopsy report, but it's nowhere to be found. So I, I would credit the ARRB very highly for the questions they asked. So in terms of regrets, I suppose there were a few more things they could have asked, but I think they covered the major issues very well. And I guess I'm not talking about them. I'm more talking about like the news broadcasters. You know, they showed the Zapruder film or they showed that on television. Um, just for the general public goes, this is a little bit graphic. It's in um, Os or not, it's not Oswald. It's in uh, Oliver Stone's Revisited where they had the guys that were sitting in the chairs on like, a, like what looks like a television stage saying, we're going to play this film. It might be graphic for the audience to watch. It's like you would expect that that would interest people in wanting to get actual clear answers from people doing interviews. And then even through Revisited, you see they have multiple clips of people speaking to people that are involved in the commission and everything like that, that there's just, oh, before I answer that question, let me just tell you this. And then they go around it and they never fully answer the question, which Oliver Stone points out. And it's just like, you would think that that would be a crucial detail that you'd want to circle back to. Well, if I were asking questions, uh, I wouldn't let people off, people off easy. I can tell you that. I would ask the question 10 times if they don't answer it. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to the Zapruder film, I got I to ask about this because this one gets a little bit uh, – crazy at times and it, it actually links in with a lot of like if they falsified x-rays because i think a lot of people have an under i guess underestimation when it comes to the amount of being able to fraud technology i know we know about like photoshop and things of that sort with modern day technology but with the zapruder film that really conflicted with a lot of witness testimonies a lot of witness testimonies talked about you know a certain when the bullet hit that there was like this explosion of brain that kind of came and then the Sapruder film showed something completely different 
Well, the limousine stop is probably the first item to focus on because <clears throat> Vince Palomara in his recent book listed 74 witnesses who reported either a limousine stop or a near stop. You see, you've seen the Zapruder film a number of times. Were you amazed that the limousine stopped when you watched the film? I didn't even, I was, I was just waiting for JFK's side of his head to get hit. Yeah, you never saw the limousine stop. Nobody reports that after seeing the film, even several times. It doesn't happen in the film. Yet that was a paramount feature to 74 witnesses in Dealey Plaza that day. How do you explain that? Well, how do you get 74 people that have a different account from just one film? How do they all agree with each other? What are the odds of that? It's just, it's crazy. I mean, I, I understand it more now. I just, I guess I, I don't really understand the full scope of film, but I mean, it took a, a while for that to finally be released, the footage of the president. The one thing that really shocks me about it is when you're watching it and you see the president waving and he looks and he looks right at the camera. He looks right at it. And then his face changes. Like his face doesn't, it doesn't look like a person that was smiling and waving to everybody. It kind of like stops. Like, am I about to get shot? Or what is that person holding type deal? And then he kind of looks away and starts going back to smiling and waving. But it's like that you get, I don't know how the big the film camera was, but I'm, I'm, I'm estimating it's probably something like this where you're holding it at this type of angle. I mean, it, it it's, there are times I'm not even a public figure, but there are times someone's holding something up in the air or holding something out like that. And it looks like a gun to me where I like stop and immediately in my tracks. Well, the head snap's a big issue in the Zapruder film as well. Virtually everybody who sees it today is blown away by the forceful backward jerk of JFK's head, supposedly when the bullet hits. And yet if you talk to the Dealey Plaza witnesses who are actually on site, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to find anybody who describes the actions that way. That is a major paradox. We see something in the film that nobody saw when they were there. What, what happened? How do you explain that? Well, I would put my money on the witnesses in this case. Well, even with the the, the Zapruder film, the first thing that I see is when he grabs his throat like this. You see something hit, and then he grabs his throat. Now, they were saying that that was a bullet from behind that came down and went out of his throat. Was that a shot from the front? Yes. Okay. But probably not a bullet, because no bullet was found. So what could it have been? A bullet passed through the windshield and produced tiny glass shards. What? There were two wounds in JFK's cheek as well, reported by the autopsy personnel. Or I should say by the, the uh, morgue personnel who were putting his body back together. I didn't know that, that. Had to be patched, that had to be patched with wax. How many autopsy reports describe two tiny cheek wounds that had to be patched, patched with wax? Never. I've never heard of anything like that. Well, why are you patching? Okay. Why are you patching holes with wax during an autopsy? Because the embalming fluid was leaking out. It couldn't. That's not cosmetically acceptable. If it was anything like the Zapruder film showed, half his head was not uh, attached or half his head was gone. That's not very cosmetic. Yeah, but if you talk to the witnesses, they did not see anything wrong when they looked at him from the front, face on. Well, even with the um, pictures that are in JFK Revisited, you look at the body of JFK, there's a giant blood spot or like giant looks piece of brain that's missing out of the back. But if you watch the Zapruder film, which I am now starting now that I understand more about the hoax of the film, for instance, when I watch it now, it makes more sense because I was always sitting there and I pause it. I go, if you're shot in the side of the head and half your brain's basically coming off, just like a lot of people talk about, that's how JFK died. But then you watch the and you see the pictures of the autopsy or his body laying there in black and white, you start going, if his back of his head's the only piece that's missing, but he was, you see in the film, he was hit from the side and something's not adding up correctly. Well, if you look at the so-called official photographs at the archives today, the back of his head is entirely intact. The hair is intact. There's virtually no blood on those so-called official photographs in the archives. You don't see a big hole there. 
So why are we? Why do we have those at the archives still? Is there a way to get the real ones in there? Because isn't that like leaving false information? Well, they were obviously destroyed. They couldn't live with the real ones. That's like the same thing with the files, right? When they were doing the autopsy reports, the guy said he deleted or he burned the fires or destroyed the files because it had blood on it. Yeah, there, there's a story from a reasonably reputable source in the Secret Service that the critical x-rays and photographs from the autopsy that showed a hole in the back of the head or more injury to the skull at the rear than is currently accepted. These were all burned deliberately. They had to, they had to hide the evidence of conspiracy. Yeah, and the one guy talked about how difficult it was to be able to recount exactly what his autopsy report says by memory. Oh, you're talking about Humes? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that was a nice excuse for him. It made him a look, look a little more innocent, which he wasn't. So he's probably more at fault than he leads on. Well, why did he call up Malcolm Perry uh, during the autopsy and tell him, him, uh, that is Perry, that Perry might lose his medical license if he didn't retract his statements about a frontal throat shot? Why would Humes do that? Why was Humes putting political pressure on Perry? It's not his job to do that. And it shouldn't be anybody's job to do that. But why is someone getting threatened about just reporting evidence that was found or reporting their statement of what they saw? Because it wasn't about science or medicine. It was about politics. Yeah, but I understand politics is a very powerful subject. But like we go back to the beginning where people would say that would be conspiracy talk. I mean, I don't know if that's just a bad label to put on something that's as true as this is. I mean, it starts to become an issue when you start realizing that politics is very, very, very powerful and it's corrupted into everything. And right now, that is some a lot of experience and a lot of issues that we're dealing with today. Political pressure is uh, so active in the world today, but I don't even want to get into that. Okay. Um, when it comes to, I, I, I'm going to blank on the person's name, but there was a, a the daughter of someone that was coming out about information, but then like last minute she canceled. Well, maybe you're talking about the daughter of Admiral Berkeley, who was the president's personal physician. He, he stated publicly that he thought there was more than one shooter. Admiral Berkeley was a medical doctor, personal physician to Kennedy. He was present in the ER in Parkland. So he had a chance to observe Kennedy's throat wounds and skull wounds. He was also present at the autopsy. He was the only a physician who was present at both sites. So surely he must have told the pathologist about the throat wound. Uh, it was obviously a, a frontal entry. If he didn't do that, then he was in on the cover up. Yeah, but he was outside of the loop, in my opinion. Like from what I've seen, if he's the, the president's personal physician, he's not hired by the government, right? No, he's a government employee. Okay, so then he's probably in on it as well, too. It's very, very hard because you're trying to figure out who's connected to who and you start it, it becomes a spider web of issues. Like you step on one thing, you realize this person's connected to this and this person's not going to talk to this. Um, and it becomes one of these events where there's a lot of evidence out there that'll show that there's a lot of hoaxes or not even hoaxes is that there's a lot of problems that should have been raised at the point. But with the mass amount of everyone scattering and doing their own things, it makes it very, very hard to keep track. This is a very complex case, which is why most professional historians stay far away from it. They're afraid of it. Yeah, but I mean, what, what's to be afraid of it now? Is there still power that you can be damaged? Yes, yes, what? yes. Okay. The official line promulgated by our current power elite is and the media especially, is that Oswald alone did it. If you deviate from that, and you say that as a professional historian, you take very serious risks, even today. That's amazing. So it's just safer for your career not to even tell Yeah, if something. you care about your career, you stay away from this. Yeah, but shouldn't you look at the evidence that's there, not the narrative that's trying to be spun? No, not if you care about your career, you won't do that.
That's so dumb. Is there anything else about the case that you find important that we might not have mentioned? Well, the collusion, the collusion of the top government officials in this was really quite amazing. In Murder in Dealey Plaza, I wrote a long essay about the historian's approach to this case. And at the end, in an appendix, I listed somewhere between 50 and 60 names of famous people who believe in a JFK conspiracy. The list is overwhelming. It's appalling. These people believe in a JFK conspiracy, all the way from LBJ, James Rowley, top people in the FBI, CIA. They all knew. They're all listed there. So what's the problem with joining the list? Well, you can't do that if your career matters to you. It's amazing. Uh, it's logically inconsistent, but that's the way things are. Well, even I don't know how much you know about the Bobby Kennedy case, but I mean, even with that, there's like a Kennedy curse they talk about. Does anybody I mean, when I I just started looking into the Bobby Kennedy case and I'm looking through that and I'm like, am, is it weird that I'm picking up like it's like smelling a wine? I'm picking up notes of the JFK assassination style. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of issues that you can correlate and see the connections between both of those things where it's like, were they gunning for the whole family? I don't believe a family curse is getting shot somewhere. You know, like that's, it's very questionable. Well, here's the most important fact about the RFK case. Do you know where the fatal bullet struck RFK in the head? I just know he was shot and there was a bus boy holding him. Um, on the floor. I'm not, I haven't really. Where, where was topic. Sirhan standing with respect to RFK? I couldn't tell Do you yet. remember the photographs? I, all I remember is uh, I'm being told a third story from, and I haven't dived into that subject. I, I wanted to cover. Well, JFK. Sirhan was standing in front of JFK, probably at the least three to five feet away from him, maybe even farther, but in front of him. But the official autopsy, carried out by Tom Noguchi, to whom I have spoken. Tom found that the fatal bullet, the one that actually killed RFK, came in near his mastoid. That's behind his ear. That's where the fatal bullet hit. It, was, it came in from behind, not the front. It's impossible for Searhan to have fired that shot. And here, you, you know what's really ridiculous? That information was deliberately kept out of the Searhan trial. But th that's much like if anybody tried to examine the magic bullet theory in court, like there's just it wouldn't hold up. Like no, that wouldn't. would be a crucial piece of evidence that you would want to. Include. There's, there's no prominence for it. It wouldn't hold up. It would be kicked out promptly by any reasonable judge. Yeah. But even with the we talk about the RFK case and Searhan, it, that's a prime piece of evidence that would get him off the hook. Yeah, of course. I doubt that Governor Newsom knows that. And, uh, now, is there a court case coming up with him soon? Or no. in, in the well, next couple of months? I think the uh, review is still under consideration, as I understand it. But, but Governor Newsom uh, does not want him out on the streets. And the same was true for Kamala Harris. She refused to let him out. She thought he would be a highly dangerous figure to let out on the streets of America. Well, they just let the one Secret Service, uh, Bolden, right? The one yeah, that... Bolden got uh, resolved, uh, absolved by uh, Biden. And was he someone that was being silenced as well, too? Yeah, he had a huge amount of political pressure on him. And, and of course, the legal case against him was totally forged. What was his evidence? Like, what was his story that... Well, he knew about the Chicago plot to kill JFK. And he also knew about the misbehavior of many Secret Service agents. So he, when he reported that, uh, they were all out to get him. And they got him you know, with a trumped-up charge and put him in jail for a number of years. Now, what made JFK be deemed as someone that the CIA or the National Security labeled them as a threat? What got him on the radar if he was calling off for war? Was that what they labeled him as a threat as? Well, JFK was at risk because he was wealthy. He didn't have to bend the knee to anyone. He could do whatever he thought was right. 
And that doesn't work in the American system. You have to obey the power elite or you're in trouble. So that was the first thing that was wrong with JFK. He was too rich. He didn't have to beg for political campaign donations. His father supported him. Is that the same similar case with RFK as well, too, that he was in the same stance where he could support himself to make his own decision? Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. But I'm just trying to figure out, like, why that? He got two brothers that are running for presidential candidacy and they both get shot. Like anybody with eyes would start to be like, that's kind of weird, don't you think? Yep, it is. JFK had stated to his confidants uh, just a few weeks before he was shot that nobody would really know. I'm sorry, I have to backtrack here. RFK had stated to his close confidants just before he was shot that we wouldn't get to the bottom of his brother's death until he, that is RFK, became president. And of course he was shot as soon as he won the California primary, which would have cleared the path to the democratic nomination for president. So RFK didn't make any giant speeches like JFK, where it was like this speech of banning nukes or these types of things. He was, were they silencing him because he might have opened up the whole can that was his brother's death? I think that was a big issue, yes. Huh. Yeah, because I'm still getting introduced to the RFK um, story and everything like that, but I wanted to hit the JFK topic because that one leaks into so many different things. I mean, even with a couple episodes I posted with Jim and um, other people that are involved with researching this, they always relate to, you know, they, he killed Marilyn Monroe. And I'm like, how does Marilyn Monroe like leak into this at all? It doesn't, none of this stuff makes sense where you start realizing everybody's got their own view of this and everyone's tackling it from different angles and everyone has their own perspectives. I, I mean, I can understand why a lot of people don't really want to talk about this on like a, a show or anything like that. Cause you don't know where people stand on a lot of these subjects. Very true. Very true. I was just thinking about the 1992 presidential campaign. Do you remember that one with Ross Perot? Well, I was born in 97. So, so you do remember it as a five-year-old? <laughs> well, I would have, if it was in 92, I was born in 97. It, was, it would have been five years. Oh, that's right. I was born. I'm yeah. going backwards. You're yeah. right. <laughs> you were minus five. Yeah. Well, do you remember from your reading, of course, why Ross Perot dropped out of that campaign after he was doing so very, very well as the third party candidate? Uh, no. You haven't read about this? No, I haven't. <laughs> he dropped out because he was afraid for his life. Okay, hold on. Was it, so We're talking about political pressure? Ross that's not Perot? pressure. That's a threat, but I'm just saying. That's very serious. Yeah. But that's... that is what he said. He dropped out because he was afraid for his life. Did anybody raise a question or do you feel like people just went with it because they didn't want him to be? I don't think we ever had a clear cut answer to that. That's what I don't get. Why are there? There's so many like things where it's like we don't have an answer to that. I'm like, well, what the what, did anybody tackle this situation? You see a problem that happens now. A lot of people are like trying to get the information out there. Well, you can like, you can do some more reading about Ross Perot and see if you can answer that. Let me know what you find. I, I don't know that he ever answered that. But we're talking about political pressure throughout this whole discussion. And that's a wonderful example of it. What scares you most about the political pressure aspects? I mean, you're seeing it from so many different angles. Like what do you, is it, is it, obviously it's still here. You're seeing that and it just gets done probably in forms that we don't really get to see publicly. Um, mostly right now what we see is probably media manipulation, which is easier to do than probably back then. But I feel like political pressure, like during the JFK case or something like that, probably influenced media manipulation as well too. I think that's probably where it started. I mean, you had a lot of issues with Operation Northwoods where um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were going to blow up an airliner and blame it on the Cubans or hijack an airliner mm -hmm. and blame it on the Cubans. Yeah. I mean, they were going to have a bunch of media people go with that story, you know, roll with it and be like, yeah, this is what happened. That wouldn't happen today. There'd be a lot of people that would be like, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do this. Well, it depends on whether you trust the media or not. I don't, not at <laughs> all. That's certainly one thing I've learned from all of this. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I, I, is that where it started? I mean, there's a lot of issues you could talk about. And when I was talking to um, Jacob or w w he was talking about like, you could, it really all dates back to this. I mean, he wrote two books about the autopsy. He wrote a lot of stuff about a deeper evil. And it's like, 
you look into these aspects. I mean, you don't want it to believe it to be true because you don't want to think the world kind of runs like that. But it, well, it, as I keep saying, I'd be much happier if Oswald had done it alone. It would be a much simpler and nicer world. Yeah. The world I thought we lived in before 1963, but I was wrong. Well, it, it really sucks because you get into this aspect of, I mean, how many, I've talked to so many academics, I've talked to so many people and it's influencing decisions and people's choices in life. You know, we've bested in this country alone, we've bested people on the aspect of thinking outside of the box, reaching for that, you know, taking that outside road and getting that, you know, crazy idea out there that next thing you know, it becomes this amazing thing. And you're having people that are not willing to take that shot all afraid that they're going to lose their job. They're going to lose yeah. their money. They're going to lose right. so much. Does that sound we, like the America that you want to live in? Now we have a ministry of truth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To, to enforce this situation. Aren't yeah. we lucky? Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Ministry of truth. I just picture a bunch of black cloaks pulling out and flipping over the hood. It doesn't make sense, man. And it really scares me because I think a lot of people, like I know a lot of people were really retweeting that because a lot of it falled upon Elon Musk buying Twitter and it lands in this area of like free speech. Now I don't like the government, but I feel like the government's needed. I just think the one that we have isn't the one that it needs to be cleaned house. It needs to be looked through again. There needs to be people put in the right positions for it. And when you see something like the ministry of truth that goes up there saying they're going to block disinformation, it's like whatever you label as that disinformation, JFK stuff, whatever you want to say, it all gets labeled under that. And it's like, you can't do that because there's clear evidence, but now you're going to block off a whole generation of people like myself. I mean, I'm 24, man. I'm researching a topic that is way, 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 way before my time, but it's something that I'm looking back at records. Now you're telling me that there might not be those records to look back on. I mean, who's to stop someone from going in the archives or someone to stop them saying those aren't the real things. These are you really, you really need to tell your audience to reread Brave New World. It's all there. Yeah. I've, I've... Disc discusses how they dispose of unpleasant records. Yeah. I've talked about that book a couple of times. Um, yeah, it's just, it's nuts, man. Cause you don't want to think it's the world that we're living in. And I, I agree with you. It would have been easier just to believe that Oswald. Oh yeah. It'd be wonderful. Wonderful to believe that. But do you think that what the people that were outspoken about this, the people that would say not outspoken as to JFK's death, but outspoken saying like Oswald was the person that killed him. Do you think internally they just knew the truth and they just were, didn't want to admit it? Well, you, you should look again at that list of 50 to 60 famous people that I listed in that appendix. You think these people say privately something different from what they say publicly? Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, you Gerald get Ford, board. remember Gerald Ford, my mm -hmm. former neighbor here on Rancho Mirage? Every day I leave this lovely gated community in Rancho Mirage, the first street I drive over is Gerald Ford Drive. But Gerald Ford told the uh, prime minister of France Valerie Destang, that he knew, he, Gerald Ford, knew that this was a conspiracy, but they just couldn't prove it. Gerald Ford said that? Yeah, he did. So did a lot of the other famous people. They all knew. Now, after JFK died with Johnson, did he do anything different? Like, did he, did, was he trying to cover it up as well, too? I mean, he was a part of the cover up, but was, well, the first thing he did, of course, was reverse steps on the Vietnam War. Kennedy was, of course, trying to withdraw, and he had plans for withdrawing 1,000 troops during that calendar year. But as soon as LBJ came in charge, he totally reversed the situation in Vietnam, and he really escalated the Vietnam War. You can read uh, McNamara's book in retrospect, uh, to appreciate the huge changes that LBJ uh, made in the policy toward Vietnam. And Bob McNamara will tell you that Kennedy would not have accelerated the war in Vietnam. And most professional historians who have looked at this, people like John Newman, for example, have concluded that LBJ totally reversed course on Vietnam. So there would be no Vietnam wall in Washington, D.C. today if Kennedy had lived.
Did anybody ever think to get any of these people that are involved in the Warren Commission or anybody that was involved in a lot of these cover up aspects that we can talk about? Um, drink, get them to drink whiskey or some type of truth serum, get them real drunk so they start spewing out stories or spewing out. Truth. Well, there was a meeting in Cuba a few years, I guess more than a few years after the assassination. I don't remember exactly when it happened. But uh, top American representatives met with top Cuban representatives, and they reviewed uh, things uh, from each of their perspectives. And one of the most enlightening things we learned was that the Cubans had nuclear missiles ready to fire at America during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We didn't know that. So if Kennedy had followed the advice of his military advisors at that time, we would have had a, a nuclear holocaust right there. Kennedy was really the only person who stopped it. With, yeah, but that doesn't really get talked about, does it? No, 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 we don't like to talk about that. You would think that would be an important thing to put in someone's career, someone trying to avoid war. Aren't we talking about possibly possible nuclear war today? Isn't that an issue in Ukraine? Why, why isn't this being talked about? It's a good question. I want to go by any of these government politicians <laughs> and I want to smell them and be like, you smell like sulfur. Yes. Like that's all I, that's all I keep picturing. It, it leads it down a really dark route. And the worst part is, is that I don't like the mind games that go with it. You know, everything leaks into politics and it boils down to left, right, all this type of stuff. And I'm like, you guys are losing the grand aspect of the big picture. And that's something that's a system that's in play. That's a lot bigger than that. Like, it's not just the side, it's something that's been going and it's been building and it's been a direction that we've been heading in in the wrongest time. I've spoken to people who were friends with William Colby, John Ran uh, Ranley, I'm going to probably say his name, last name wrong. He was on the show and we talked about it. he was friends with William Colby. Guy had integrity when it came to blowing the whistle about how the CIA was going down a very, very dark and horrible path. And it, that's with Watergate. Now, I talked about Watergate and I'm looking back on it. I'm like, I can tell he's like an, he's a, he's a whistleblower, but he was a part of this, but it takes a big man to step up and admit the actions that you were doing are wrong. And especially want to stop it. Cause you see the direction that you're heading in now, how long, I mean, we all know back pain, for instance, you just get used to it. You end up, that becomes normal. It becomes the new normal. When you talk have about JFK and back pain, you're right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good one too. It's now, a prime example of that. That um. Well, even uh, are we talking about literal back pain? Because oh he, yeah, he was in constant pain. Back if pain. You, if you see, that's the, why he had the rocking chair. Yeah. Well, if you see the Wikipedia thing, they say um in in the little biography about him, they say that the reason why that when he gets hit with a bullet and he doesn't lean over like most people would if he was shot from the back, they say it was he had a back brace. Yeah, he did have a back brace. Yeah, that was keeping <laughs> pretty pretty up. low. It wasn't it wasn't so much on his chest, but lower down. Yeah, but enough to where he couldn't really fold down all the way, which kept him propped up. I want to make one more point about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um. One of the reasons that JFK was so hated by his military was that he did not drop a nuclear bomb on Cuba, which virtually they all wanted to do. So that was part of the animosity toward Kennedy. But of course, he had many other enemies beside the military, the CIA among them, as well as the oil men in Texas. And uh, he was going to produce treasury notes, thus bypassing the Federal Reserve. So the top bankers were against him. The list of his powerful enemies is long. It's incredible. Yeah, a lot of these, um, especially even now today, a lot of people point to the president to be the person that makes the calls. And I don't think that to be true. You got a lot of people like the CIA, the FBI that have been running loose for a very, very long time. Like the CIA is supposed to have rules of not working on U.S. ground or anything of that sort. Yes, good point. Here. Good point. Yeah. I mean, when eventually does it edge over like all government power does where they end up moving the goalposts and eventually how long until they start actually working over here where they're not supposed to be working well that's a matter of oversight isn't it congress is not very good at oversight of the intelligence agencies in fact they're afraid of them as uh, chuck schumer has made very clear by the way i mean so is it a problem on oversight or is it how many palms can be greased it's almost non-existent yeah it just seems like there's a lot more people that are willing to nod their head and accept what's going on and it leads us to pos positions that we're in today it's a huge amount of power again. 
expressed by the intelligence agencies. Congress is afraid of them. I mean, everybody should be. If they can kill the president, you think he can't get killed? They talk about insider trading. I see Pelosi start sweating. Like I'm just going. I get to the. I get to this point where like, why is anybody questioning this stuff? But you talk about it. They label you a conspiracy. Mm-hmm. They label you a right wing. I'm like, no. It's just. It's. It's honestly. It's the best business strategy. People don't care about helping out another person unless they can get something for themselves. That's a hundred percent true, and it's a. It's. It's very very difficult to come to grips with because people want to think that they have the same morals as someone that they put into power. It's like no, they have a whole host of things. It's very very hard when you're passing a bill to think about future generations because you can't imagine those faces. That's why it's especially shocking when one person does do that, and we haven't seen that in a very long time. I'm pretty educated not, on that. Not many true patriots left. You're right. I, I told John um, this exactly when he was on my show. I said, I'm a patriot at heart. I really care about our government. I think it's needed, even though I might probably side with more libertarian views. Um, I just think everything, when you put a position in power, whenever, like, for instance, if I asked you, who are the candidates up? You'd be like, left party or right party. I'm like, what about an independent? And then people go, they'll never win. Well, if we're living in a simulation, why don't you test it and throw an independent up there? But it doesn't it doesn't come into grips. It doesn't come into reality. Well, we, we saw what happened to Ross Perot. Yeah, it's you just you, you get he was being too successful. If he hadn't been so successful, nobody would have bothered him. I just it's a it's a it's the same rat race going every single time and we expect it to change with the same exact outcomes it's either this side or it's that side i don't really care for politics as much but one thing i really don't like is corruption and i can smell a lot of that that's going on around there and that's business influence into a lot of situations and it puts people in hard positions where you have people that especially during this pandemic cutting each other off just not talking to each other all because it's a trump or a biden thing that is so stupid if you don't like corruption, you'd better not move to Ukraine. Oh, yeah. that's, that's a whole that's a whole nother. Uh, yes, topic. that's another whole discussion. <laughs> um, but David, man, you've given me enough of your time, dude. Seriously, it's been a pleasure chat with you. I really appreciate you for coming and doing my show. You didn't have to do that. And I really appreciate it. Well, it's a lovely day here in Ranch Mirage with at least half of it left. So I will enjoy <laughs> some outdoor activities. Thank uh, you, Robbie. Is there a place where people can find you? Do you have any links that you want to promote? And I'll make sure I link it in the episode. Yeah, my, my website is The Mantic View. The Mantic View. That's all you have to do to type in. Got a Twitter? No, I don't have a Twitter account. You should get one and add me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure I link your website in the description. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for listening to this episode out of the Blank Podcast.